for operations with on matters related to public policy and issues associated with nuclear plant operations. And he was very closely with Excellence uh, Government Regulation Affairs and Public Policy Groups. Uh, before his current assignment, uh, he was uh, Vice President, Senior Vice President at Exelon for West Operations, and responsible for the Exelon Generations uh, units at Dresden, Quad Cities, and Fort Calhoun in Nebraska. Uh, and before that, he was uh, Vice President for the Quad Cities and uh, Vice President Plant Manager for the Dresden Nuclear Power Plants. So, please. <clears throat> yeah, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Argon for inviting us to this, uh, this event. Um, you know, the, the experiments that were done um, 75 years ago with CP1 not only led to Argon National Lab as an institute, but largely led to Exelon in, in its current form. Um, you know, both of us are uh, Chicago land areas, and um, Exelon being committed to nuclear power, we're uh, tied very closely with the lab, and you know, I'm excited about the five-year cooperative agreement that Exelon has with Argonne to help speed technology from the laboratory uh, to the market, so that's a recent development that I'm very excited about. A little history or a little overview of what Exelon is. We are the largest uh, power company in the United States, a Fortune 100 company. Uh, we not only, we, we actually function in all forms of power, from generation, transmission, distribution, wholesale and retail marketing. We also have a large gas company, um, along with our deregulated uh, generation. Um, <clears throat> we do business in all 48 states, the District of Columbia, Canada, and had over $31 billion in revenue last year. We have about 30, 34,000 employees, um, and from the nuclear standpoint, produce over uh, 20,000 megawatts of electricity from the 23 reactors that we run in 14 different sites. The nuclear part accounts for about 55% of our total generation portfolio, and we have an industry-leading capacity factor of over 94% for our reactors last year. And out of the 11 nuclear units in, the, uh, in Illinois at the six different sites, that accounts for about 48% of the generation in Illinois and over 90% of the zero emissions generation in Illinois. So the, the title of this, uh, this symposium is The Future of Nuclear Power, or The Future of Nuclear Energy. And I really look at that as a question. Um, and I think it's uh, some of the things I'm gonna cover here shortly will hopefully uh, help guide where, where, we, where that question is going to, uh, the answer to that question is gonna land. We are truly at a crossroads, and uh, over the next decade at the latest, I think we'll have to, we'll be making that decision, whether we do it intentionally or just let it happen without making a conscious decision of where we're going with that. Nuclear power has a number of uh, tremendous attributes that I think are truly underappreciated in the market. Um, from a reliability standpoint, the industry produces about 20% of all the U.S. net generation. That's really been unchanged over uh, about the past decade, even with the closing of a number of plants. It's been compensated with up rates at some plants, um, and actually the, the downward trend in demand across the United States. So that's been pretty consistent. 24-7 uh, baseload operation is the most reliable source of power and runs even when the weather's at its worst. If you remember the polar vortex several years ago, Gas was unavailable to start up the gas plants because they did not have firm contracts and the gas was dedicated to home heating. Coal piles froze and actually once the polar vo vortex moved in, wind generation went essentially to zero. Um, nuclear was really the backbone which kept the electric grid in the eastern half of the United States from collapsing. From an environmental standpoint, Nuclear by far is the largest source of carbon-free energy. We provide almost two-thirds of America's clean electric energy, <clears throat> which is more than wind, solar, and hydro combined. The, new, the U.S. nuclear fleet annually prevents the emissions equivalent to greater than all of the passenger cars in the United States. So if you took away the nuclear energy, essentially you'd be doubling the amount of emissions that you would get from the, the automobiles in the U.S. 
<clears throat> Counter to that, look at what's going on in Germany. The German phase out of nuclear plants will create an additional 300 million tons of CO2 through 2020. And that you know, something not, not uh, talked about very much, the, the backup generation generally used in um, Germany is lignite coal, one of the, the dirtiest sources of electric, electrical generation that you can find. Nuclear de delivers tremendous economic benefit. Over 100,000 Americans with good paying jobs are employed through the nuclear industry. Many of these are in small towns where the nuclear plant is the economic hub in that area, and, and those areas are totally reliant on the nuclear plant for their survival for things like infrastructure, education, and really to keep those communities alive. On average, nuclear energy facilities generate $470 million in sales of goods and services in the local communities, and nearly $40 million in total labor, labor annual income. Each year, it pays about $67 million in federal taxes and almost $16 million in state and local taxes. Um, an interesting fact, the single largest property taxpayer in the United States outside of Manhattan for a single site is Byron Station in northern Illinois. It has the highest property tax bill of anywhere outside of Manhattan. So with all of those benefits, you would certainly think that nuclear power would be um, highly valued and would be actually expanding in the United States, and of course we know that's not true. Um, nuclear energy faces really a perfect storm of a lot of different things coming together. Uh, electricity prices are at an all-time low, largely due to the natural gas, uh, the high uh, availability of natural gas due to the shale gas mining. <clears throat> but also market conditions and inequities built into the market fail to properly value nuclear for all the values it's delivered that I talked about previously. In this way, nuclear is competing in a market with one tie hand tied behind its back. Uh, I'm not going to go deeply into the market because this is more of a technology based, but when you are dealing in a competitive market um, against other sources of generation that are receiving subsidies, it really isn't an open market condition. Um, get, we, we view electricity in the competitive markets as a commodity. The one issue that, to deal with is with electricity. You have to sell it the instant it's produced, unlike other commodities where you can hold until the price is higher. Nuclear lacks that capability, or electricity lacks that capability. And some of the things we are competing against where wind and solar have built into their, um, their economic models, the subsidies they produce, for some reason, even though nuclear provides similar environmental benefits and, and other benefits that I've described, they, they've been left, we've been left out of the picture in that. As a result of that, uh, Bloomberg had a recent study that said 61 of the nuclear facilities um, are currently losing money and in the, uh, at risk of early closure. <clears throat> Meanwhile, cost to operate the nuclear plants have continued to rise thanks in part to increased regulation. Oh, I forgot to go forward. So some of the impacts of that, um, three nuclear units recently have closed down for strictly economic reasons. That's Kiwani, Vermont Yankee, and Fort Calhoun. Four more units, Pilgrim, Oyster Creek, Three Mile Island, Palisades are all scheduled to close in the next few years, uh, mostly due to, to economic challenges. The, what this shot, slide shows is the impact of just closing San Onofre, Crystal River, Vermont Yankee, and Kiwani almost um, is equivalent to all of the solar power that is, was generated in, 2000 and, in 2015. So when you add those additional plants on top of that, all of the solar power that has ever been built in the United States cannot overcome that gap uh, in generation. And that generation will largely be uh, replaced with natural gas generation. <clears throat> uh, the U.S. nuclear fleet, we've already seen a significant environmental consequences, increasing CO2 emissions by 6.4 million tons a year, the equivalent of about it adding 1.2 million cars to the road. So this chart again shows how that issue will continue to add up if we continue to close plants early. So the question is, where do we go from here? And our answer is innovation. 
And innovation from not just a policy standpoint, which is what I've been largely involved in the last few years, but innovation in a technical, technical standpoint. Um, there's really two camps, people that believe that the market is operating efficiently and that we should let plants that are not economical close down and the, and the grid kind of uh, rely on the market. That no action uh, option, I think, will lead to some serious issues, particularly with grid re resiliency. If you, uh, any nuclear plant closing down will essentially be replaced with natural gas, which doesn't have the same sorts of electrical attributes that, or, or benefits that uh, nuclear can provide with on-site fuel and the ability to operate without uh, bringing in fuel on a constant basis from the pipeline. So if you believe that we need a diverse energy, diverse mix of energy sources, and you recognize the enormous value that the current fleet provides and you need to advocate for innovation, both policy and operations. I will spend a short period talking about policy. The recent DOE study had some uh, good news, I think, for us in that it recognizes that base load operation is necessary and that the energy markets are flawed um, in, in not recognizing the value of base load generation. Um, the two quotes there right out of the report give us some hope that uh, action will be done on the uh, FERC level or somewhere through the uh, independent system operators to modify the energy market to better reward nuclear for the attributes that it provides. On a state level, um, some two states in particular, Illinois and New York, both where we own plants, have uh, developed programs to help support the nuclear plants in those areas. Uh, the, um, in Illinois, uh, they passed the zero emission credit where essentially nuclear is put on par with some of the other renewable resources um, for the plants that were not economically challenged. That actually led us to be able to reverse the decision to shut down Clinton and Quad City Station last year, and both of those plants are currently operating. Um, in kind of an interesting twist, last week when the um, temperature was extremely high and some units were already in the, um, their outage season because we were in September, the price of electricity around the Clinton area was going at about $300 a megawatt hour. Had Clinton not been operating during that time period, it's very likely they would have had a significant shortage in southern Illinois because there was essentially no wind energy producing at that, at that time. <clears throat> um, in, in New York, uh, was not legislation that was passed, but um, through the Public Service Commission, passed a very aggressive bill for a clean energy standard that also recognizes the value of nuclear in uh, lowering CO2 emissions. Um, both of those programs, the one in Illinois is for 10 years and the one in New York is in 12 years. Um, very important to be able to keep those plants open, if nothing else, as a bridge to different environmental um, sources as they come online. Um, an interesting side note in Illinois, the bill that was passed to keep the nuclear plants open was the only bill passed in Illinois in two years that did not deal with some kind of continuing resolution to keep the government operating. So um, it was not an easy push, but we were certainly happy that that, uh, that came on. You know, from a big picture policy standpoint, though, from a, um, you know, FERC and an RTO perspective, one of the things that is essential to keeping those plants operating is that those programs are not mitigated somehow in the capacity market. That would leave those plants, again, vulnerable to be not being economically viable. <clears throat> so this is a, a picture of the uh, rally we had at the State House in Springfield, and you can see a uh, large turnout that was not just the employees at the station, but the people in the communities. And I think we've got better recognition from the people that live around the nuclear plants, how important they are to the viability of those plants. We're encouraged to see that there's discussion, at least in Pennsylvania, Ohio, New Jersey, and Connecticut, about similar programs to, uh, to keep the, the economically challenged plants in those areas um, open, uh, but it's gonna take a lot of hard work to get that, uh, to keep that moving. We have seen an increase, or some increase in uh, support from some of the environmental groups, recognizing that uh, taking the nuclear plants off the grid will greatly undermine their, uh, their ultimate goals. Um, but again, it's going to be a, a, a uh, difficult effort to do this as a state-by-state -state basis, and unless we can get real market reforms, 
that values and recognizes the various attributes nuclear brings, it's going to be a difficult thing to keep all of these plants open. So beyond policy, what else are we doing? Um, as an industry, we recognize that our operating costs were going up dramatically. And through that, there was an industry initiative that was pulled together called Delivering the Nuclear Promise. And the goal of that was to lower the fleet average cost by 30% from 2012 levels. Um, pretty aggressive goal, and I can tell you that uh, we have seen tremendous gains out of that. Um, but it is likely not enough to keep all of the plants open that are currently in operation. Um, we have realized that a lot of the costs that we have borne are, you know, a result not necessarily of direct regulation, but of, of uh, requirements we put our, on ourselves over the years. So we are continue with, continuing with that um, and in hopes of driving down the cost as far as we can on the nuclear plants. For ex uh, I went a little too far. For Exelon in particular, we have a... <clears throat> We are working on a number of uh, different innovative techniques to lower costs. GE Watchtower, which is really um, integrates information from plant systems into uh, software that monitors the plant equipment to help you do more predictive maintenance as opposed to time-based maintenance, and through that help lower your cost. Um, Lighthouse Analytics is more of a, um, a uh, organizational look to look for dips in organizational function. Digital Plant Viewer, um, we now have the ability to see um, 3D pictures of the plant as we're doing briefings for uh, people going out in the plant and that will show you real live data on what the dose rates are at various parts of the plant um, that cuts down on uh, the amount of time out in the plant. And Project Vision, which <clears throat> is to incorporate, again, that with um, some of the places that we don't often go. So as we're doing just-in-time taming, training, pre-job briefs, those kind of things, the, the workers can actually see where they're going to be in the plant, look for obstructions, look for things that may hinder their work, and really speed up the, getting the work done. So a lot of those things are all coming together. Um, the, the thing that ultimately comes out of this, though, is the only way to monetize these things. We're not going to get a whole lot of increase in capacity factor. Already over 94% is a fleet. It really is a reduction in workforce, which cuts in greatly into the support we get for keeping these plants open from a local level. But we've really squeezed down a lot of the other costs. Fuel costs are really have come down since the Fukushima accident. We've reduced our capital expenditure. The, um, the operations and maintenance budgets is the last place we really have to look. And, and uh, really to monetize that, it's going to be a reduction in, in the workforce, which is, um, you know, we do not have targets for that, but it's something that needs to be recognized that we have a constituency out there that has been very supportive of us, and we want to make sure that they are uh, taken care of in this. So um, the amount we can get out of that is going to be limited by the, uh, our ability to, to reduce the workforce, which, I, you know, again, we don't have targets on that. Um, but we have to recognize the tremendous support we got from the workers at these plants to, uh, to keep the plants open. Um, we've also in, opened up an innovation center. Um, recognizing that we need a lot of little ideas to try out to see what pays off. So if you go to the second floor of our nuclear headquarters at Cantera, you'll see there's an innovation center that's uh, dedicated to really coming up with unique ideas, getting them quickly into practice, see which one of those ideas are beneficial, um, and then following through with getting that implemented across the fleet. Um, and those that, that don't pan out, you have to kill quickly. I mean, that's the, the nature of innovation. So we're trying to adopt that model more to get more control over our, 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 uh, our budgets our, um, and take more control of our own destiny. So the future of nuclear, uh, of U.S. nuclear, we got to look at the low-hanging fruit. There's a lot of discussion about advanced nuclear, small modular reactors, new build and those kind of things. From the standpoint that we look at it, those things will not happen in the United States if we can't maintain the current fleet in operation. If nuclear is viewed as a declining industry, you'll get very little support, very little support for the public, which means very little support from politicians. So we think it's key to keeping the current nuclear plants open to be able to be a player in what could be a very big increase in nuclear power across the globe. 
some things from a, um, from a technical standpoint that we think are very important um, that, uh, that we could ask for help. You know, advanced uh, or accident tolerant fuel, um, I think is a big issue. If, you, if we could truly develop fuel that has an increased coping time, would certainly reduce the amount of money we spend on a lot of the safety systems that are uh, there to make sure that the core isn't ever uncovered. So we are very uh, excited about some of the movements that's going on in the area and fully support that. Um, the other thing that, that Exelon is looking at in particular is looking for alternate purposing for nuclear plants. Um, the big issue impacting the nuclear plants and their economics are really the price of power in off-peak time periods. Um, with uh, wind energy that comes in um, at various times, um, whether it's needed or not, um, uh, oftentimes, in fact, Quad City Station two years ago operated 13% of the time at negative pricing at its, uh, at its hub, at its switchyard. Uh, if we could find a way to store that energy either thermally or electrically and use it in times of higher prices would certainly be beneficial. So some sort of of storage or usage in off-peak hours. So we, um, Exelon held a symposium earlier this year. I've got some exciting ideas that we're working on through that area, but those are really two big areas that I think, you know, any help from the National Labs would certainly be appreciated. <clears throat> so not to contradict my former, uh, my, the previous speaker, but, you know, Charles Darwin said it's not the strongest of the species sur that survive or the most intelligent, but it's the most able to adapt. And right now, that's really where nuclear power is in the United States. If we're not able to adapt and uh, make our case both in a policy standpoint and innovate from a technological standpoint, uh, we'll go the way of many species that we're not able to adapt in those uh, changing environments. And I think that's the end for me.